Okay, uh, we're back, and this will be lecture eight. And I was talking about uh, specific phobias, and particularly about natural environment uh, types of phobias. And I was starting to talk about a uh, case that I saw when I when we were at uh, when I was at the University of Pittsburgh. This is a woman who uh, worked for the university. She was in her early 50s. And she'd had this fear of heights since early childhood. And there was, in fact, a traumatic onset in this example. She remembered very clearly that when she was about uh, three or four years old, her father was uh, painting the house. And she was at a second floor window. And she leaned out to wave at him down below where he was painting and she lost her balance and fell out of the window. So she fell out of a second f floor window. Her father was right below and caught her and she was actually not injured, fortunately. But the experience of losing her balance and that sense of losing her balance at a height and falling uh, was sort of the prototype for her of what she experienced any time she was uh, uh, at, uh, at a height. The uh, fear was clearly distressing, but as with many people with specific phobias, she had developed adaptations to it. Uh, she and her husband had a one-story house. She couldn't go upstairs. One-story houses are common in Houston. They're not so common in uh, Pittsburgh, but they'd uh, found one. Uh, she couldn't climb a ladder either, so her husband did all of those kinds of change the light bulb and, and uh, such. Uh, she did all of her shopping in, in first-floor stores. She'd go to a department store, and she could shop for whatever was on the first floor, but anything that was on another floor uh, she'd buy from a catalog or uh, get somebody else to buy for her. She found doctors and dentists, all of whom had first floor offices, so that she wouldn't have to go up uh, stairs or elevators for uh, offices. Uh, she was afraid of crossing bridges. And again, if you lived in Houston, that wouldn't be a huge problem. But if you've ever been to Pittsburgh, there's lots of hills and valleys there. I think something like 365 bridges in the city, and it's much more of a problem. She could cross a bridge if her husband was driving. She felt safe when he was driving. When she was driving herself, it was very difficult. And again, uh, she wouldn't typically wouldn't go out of the immediate neighborhood uh, uh, and cross a bridge if she was driving herself. The incident that led her to come in for treatment at the uh, University of uh, Pittsburgh, there's a building called the Cathedral of Learning, which is a uh, Gothic architecture, 28-story uh, building that was somebody's idea of what an urban university ought to be like in the 1920s. And uh, she was uh, assigned a new, uh, given a new assignment, uh, uh, which was to a job on the 16th floor from the job on the first floor of another building that she had been working in for a number of years. And she decided she really sh should try to do this. So the first morning she went, she got on the elevator, she went up to the 16th floor, she avoided looking at or, or uh, out the windows and uh, did all right for the morning, went to lunch with somebody and came back and got to the elevator and decided she just couldn't do it. She couldn't get on the elevator and she couldn't go back up to work. So this became a big issue about her job and what was going on here, etc. And she came to our training clinic Graduate student working with her, I thought, developed a very nice treatment plan, developed a hierarchy with her of different situations from mildly uh, fearful to more fearful. And the plan was to go through the uh, uh, imaginal 
set of scenes and when she was able to get to imagine uh, uh, crossing bridges and heights of various sorts. Then they were going to do some actual uh, in vivo desensitization and there was a, this same building had stairways that went up a half a floor and there was a window. Then you went up the next half a floor and there was a window. So they were going to do desensitization with this spatial hierarchy of climbing uh, stairs. Very nice treatment plan. The woman had a long talk with her boss who was very understanding and decided to uh, reassign her back to where she was before in the, on the first floor of the building. And when presented with the treatment plan, the patient agreed that it would probably work, but she didn't think she wanted to do it because it would be too scary and effortful, and so she uh, uh, stopped treatment and uh, continued living uh, and adapting to her phobia. Uh, which again, of the, I think one of the points I'd like to make is that many people do uh, have what we would consider fairly uh, uh, debilitating phobias and nevertheless they adapt to them. Uh, situational phobias Things like darkness, these are transportation phobias, flying phobias, etc. Uh, claustrophobias in enclosed spaces. These, interestingly, are pretty much equal between males and uh, females. Uh, onset uh, tends to be a little bit later, anywhere from childhood through to the mid uh, 20s. Uh, and these, uh, we'll t t talk later about agoraphobia, uh, uh, which is uh, uh, also has to do with fears of places, open spaces often. Uh, and this is kind of related, it's maybe in the same spectrum, although there are different qualities to the uh, agoraphobia we talked about. Uh, the example I like to give here is a uh, my miracle cure of a uh, flying phobia. Uh, this is a man who came to see me because he, he had a fear of flying, didn't like to, to fly, uh, and hadn't flown for many years, but he was going to have to fly in just a few weeks for his job, and he didn't want to have to d tell his boss that he was too afraid to fly, so he decided he was going to make the uh, uh, trip. Uh, there was a kind of traumatic uh, onset to this really uh, claustrophobia for him. He described an incident when he was about eight or nine years old where he and some other boys lived in, uh, he lived on a farm and there was a haystack and they had dug a tunnel into this haystack quite far into the uh, haystack and this can be actually quite dangerous uh, uh, children have suffocated from tunnels like that collapsing. In any case, he went in first and his two friends came in behind him. So here he was in this little tiny, dark, closed, enclosed space, uh, stuffy, it was hot summer day, and two boys behind him blocking his exit. And he, he panicked and got very frightened and started yelling and crying and the other boys backed out and pulled him out and he was all right. But again for him that was sort of the, the, the prototype of the feeling he had when he was in an enclosed space. Uh, and it, it didn't bother him very frequently. There weren't very many instances where his fear uh, interfered. He described one event where he went with his uh, family to Disneyland. And if you've ever been to Disneyland, there's a submarine ride uh, where the submarine is, it's like a real submarine and you go in the submarine and you go around uh, looking out the windows at, at the water. Uh, and he got in the submarine and they started to close the hatch and he said, wait, 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 I'm not going to do this. And uh, uh, left. Uh, and again, the, in, the enclosure of the submarine was uh, felt to him like the uh, uh, 
claustrophobic sort of situation. Uh, and for him, that's what airplanes were like. The worst time in a flight for him was that moment when they closed the front door and turned the, uh, turned the lock, and then you, uh, for him, it meant you're locked in this metal tube uh, that's going to go up in the air and you can't escape and uh, all sorts of terrible things could happen you could have a terrible anxiety attack and you'd be trapped in this uh, in the airplane so it was very much that for him a feeling of uh, claustrophobia now other people just to make the point uh, we talk about specific fears and they sound like you would assume that fear of flying is fear of flying but different people have very different fears of flying for some people it's uh, the enclosed space for some people it's heights uh, it's the looking out the window other people it's anticipation of uh, crashing and they listen to every uh, change in the sound of the engine and that sort of thing uh, people can focus on very different aspects of the flying experience uh, to have a, a, a phobia. In any case, uh, it became clear in the first session that this was a very delimited fear, that there weren't other problems going on, that this was in any way related uh, to. And I talked to him about doing desensitization and described to him the process of teaching him to relax and uh, that then we would pair images, etc. And he was actually reluctant. He didn't like the idea of relaxation training. He, he felt like that was sort of losing control or giving up control. And I tried to explain to him that it was really the opposite, that it was more gaining control of your muscles and being able con to control your relaxation in the face of the situation, and explained that way Oh, and also he said it sounded to him too much like hypnosis. And hypnosis uh, meant giving up control to another person. And I was saying, no, no, this is, this is, this is learning control, not giving up control. So I uh, uh, said, we've got a few minutes left in the session. Let me show you a little bit what we're, what we're going to do. And what you do typically is to start out with tensing certain muscles and then relaxing them. And, tense another muscle and relax. And I was uh, going to sort of start telling him that's what I was going to do and we we're just going to relax arms and legs today. And uh, asked him to sit back in the chair and relax. And he kind of went like that, like he was out almost. I think he was probably a, a very hypnotizable subject and he relaxed completely. I mean, I had him go through some of these exercises. He came back a few days later and said, wow, that relaxation, that's really powerful. I've been relaxed ever since that session. And I'd really only, you know, begun uh, to do this. Uh, anyway, we went through the relaxation. He had to fly. We did a total of three sessions. Uh, I suggested to them that he go out to the airport early and go out to the uh, gate and do his relaxation exercises and he called me afterwards and was so pleased with himself he said he'd gone out and he said I knew how powerful that relaxation was and that if I started to get anxious at all on the plane I could do that relaxation so I never got anxious uh, it prevented him from getting anxious again uh, anxiety often is anticipatory about what the terrible things that going to happen and for a lot of people uh, with situational uh, uh, fears it's the anticipation of having an anxiety attack in that situation it's fear of fear uh, uh, it's fear of being embarrassed by having an anxiety attack so here he sort of law lo had lost the fear of fear because he felt he had something to do to uh, uh, t uh, to control it and did not uh, have the uh, uh, the response. Uh, actually, that, re that reminds me that I had another thing that I put on here. Uh, phobias. You sometimes see lists like this, uh, all different phobias, and I just actually pulled this out of a out of 
four-page list that I had from somewhere of phobias. These all really have uh, no particular status. Uh, all you need to do is find a Greek stem and add it to phobia and you've got uh, a new uh, type of phobia. Uh, there's, there's no, uh, these words are not in the diagnostic and uh, statistical manual. Also, uh, well, all right, we've got another list in, in a minute for another disorder. Let me go back to the uh, phobias. Uh, blood injection injury phobias are interesting, uh, and they're differentiated from the other fears because they have a, a, a unique, a different physiology. Uh, ordinarily, in most fears, you get uh, a sympathetic arousal and your blood pressure goes up, uh, etc. The opposite happens with blood injury phobias. Uh, blood pressure drops and you're in danger of fainting. Uh, people faint in the doctor's office. They faint when they're going to get a, an injection. They faint at the sight of blood. Uh, this one also tends to run in families. There seems to be some predisposition, predisposition that's genetic. Uh, it also tends to be a little bit more frequent in women, 55 to 70 percent. Uh, I once saw a uh, young teenage boy uh, who'd had the experience of being in the hospital, he got ill when he was 12 or something like that, and uh, a nurse had come to, given a, given, to give him a shot and had, had trouble finding uh, the vein and had kind of stuck him and then stuck him again and then stuck him again without saying what she was doing. And he, after being stuck three or four times, he uh, kind of panicked and got very upset about it and uh, didn't want her to give him the shot and kind of had an argument in any case. From that traumatic experience, he had developed a fear of hypodermic needles and of getting uh, shots. Uh, what I, I did for treatment was, again, exposure treatment here, uh, kind of unsystematic desensitization. Uh, there was a graduate student at the time who was also a nurse, a uh, graduate student in our program and she was able to get me some hypodermic needles of different sizes and one of the things they teach you in nursing school or to, when you learn how to uh, say uh, 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 take blood or something is you practice with an orange puncturing the skin of an orange is kind of like puncturing the skin and and so anyway I brought in an orange and a couple of hypodermic needles and he had fun sort of uh, uh, extracting juice and uh, giving the orange a shot and that sort of thing. But the idea was to get him uh, feeling comfortable with it, knowing what it felt like, and, and feeling in control. And the other thing that I did was to talk to him about being uh, in control, saying, you know, you can say to somebody who's going to give you a shot, I'll tell you when I'm ready, uh, and, you know, uh, don't. I don't want any surprises here. Uh, uh, okay, you know, uh, ready, set, uh, go. And you can negotiate uh, with the person and uh, uh, have them give you the shot when you're ready for it. So we did that and he kind of practiced that and uh, uh, we did some imaginal desensitization of getting shots and then I had the uh, uh, nurse come in and as sort of his final exam uh, she gave him a little saline solution shot or something like that which he was he already was already to say you know okay I'll tell you when I'm ready I'll tell you when I'm ready just give me a few more minutes and it took him about 25 minutes to be ready but he finally said yes and got the shot and he was very pleased with himself and uh, had needed needed shots to go to school in the fall 
uh, so was able to uh, get his shots. Uh, choking phobias are another uh, instance here. These are uh, fairly uh, uh, unusual, but they have to do with a sense of choking and sometimes actual uh, uh, tightening of the throat to have difficulty swallowing things. Remember, I have read a published case of a choking phobia that had traumatic onset. Man was at a bar and took a big swig from his bottle of beer that had a cockroach had just crawled into. Uh, and after that experience, he was not able to drink anything from an opaque container. He only could drink things from clear glasses and they had to be clear liquids. He wouldn't drink anything that was uh, uh, dark uh, and was uh, 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 treated for this uh, uh, condition and it was written up as a case study. Uh, I saw a woman who had a kind of choking uh, phobia. She had difficulty eating and she was actually losing a great, she had lost a great deal of weight because she, uh, she literally just couldn't eat. She'd eat a few uh, uh, whatever mouthfuls of food and then her, she'd get this choking sensation. Her throat seemed to tighten and she couldn't eat anymore. And so her response to this was to try to eat as fast as she could and get as much down before she started feeling uh, choking. And I actually suggested that she try the opposite, that she uh, uh, that that this was probably partly some kind of anxiety response of the tensing of the muscles, uh, and it was her fear that it was going to happen that was partly making it uh, happen. And I suggested to her that she uh, try to relax uh, and eat slowly and simply uh, go to having like five or six meals a day rather than. Uh, uh, two or three that she was having uh, so that she could get uh, more food down. And uh, this was really just kind of a consultation with her, so I never got any feedback as to whether it was successful. Uh, social phobias uh, actually are another class of phobia in the, uh, yeah, don't I, I don't, yes, okay. Uh, social phobias have to do with uh, phobias about uh, social situations, social performance in different situations. Public speaking phobia is the most common form of social phobia. Uh, social phobias vary considerably in their generality. Some people, for some people, it's a relatively specific. Uh, phobia of public speaking. They have difficulty getting up in front of a group and speaking, uh, getting up in a, a class and, and uh, speaking. Uh, epidemiological studies find about two-thirds cases uh, are women. However, if you look, if you look at clinic samples, men are more likely to seek treatment and in terms of uh, uh, records of clinics uh, cases, uh, you see more men than uh, women. It tends to be a, a uh, teenage onset, adolescent onset uh, disorder, often with some kind of uh, traumatic uh, event involved of uh, embarrassment or uh, humili humiliation in a uh, social situation. Uh, again, public speaking is by far the most typical uh, form, but for other people it's any time that they might be the center of attention. Uh, it may focus around evaluation, situations where a person feels they're being evaluated, situations where they need to be assertive, uh, or just uh, certain specific situations. For some people, eating in restaurants is very difficult. Uh, it's uh, uh, people who are, have a phobia about eating in restaurants 
again have a sense that they'll do something embarrassing. They'll uh, knock the water over, they'll drop something on the floor, and they'll be uh, people will stare at them and they're, they'll be embarrassed. There are people who can't use public restrooms that they uh, have a social phobia about uh, being in restrooms with other people. Uh, some people have difficulty writing in public and uh, can't write a check. Uh, the bank have to do all of the paperwork before they go into the bank to uh, uh, cash a check. Later we'll talk about personality disorders, and there's a personality disorder uh, described as avoidant personality. And avoidant personality, some people would argue, is sort of the, the far end of social phobia in terms of generality. Uh, people with avoidant personality are avoidant of virtually any situation, any social situation, any encounter with uh, other people. Uh, so again, that might that might be the most uh, the general form of social phobia. Uh, social phobias tend to be anticipatory. That is, people are anxious in anticipating situations where they're likely to be uh, under scrutiny. And the from a cognitive perspective, uh, feelings of social inadequacy. I'm going to be, people are going to see my inadequacy in the situation. The ideas of scrutiny, that is that, the, that you're going to be looked at, you're going to be examined by other people. The, the possibility of criticism uh, is another typical cognitive aspect. And an exaggerated sense of so, social danger, that is that terrible things could happen to you uh, if you get anxious in uh, a social situation. Some people uh, have suggested that social phobias may have to do with our evolutionary background in sort of social dominance hierarchies. In many uh, primate communities you have pecking orders of uh, dominance and uh, social phobia to display uh, social phobia is to d display uh, your lower status on a uh, dominance uh, hierarchy and it's uh, argued that this may be related to our evolutionary uh, history with regard to issues of dominance and submission. Uh, Talk about uh, uh, a case. Uh, this is a guy who was a, uh, he managed a, a department in a large uh, a department store. And uh, he had no, uh, he did well in that situation. He was, didn't have any trouble. He could deal with a, uh, an angry, uh, uh, you know, customer who was bringing something back. He could deal with problematic uh, employees, etc., and didn't have any trouble in those situations. The big problem for him was that there was a monthly meeting of all of the department managers, and uh, this was a sort of a, a sales meeting. They'd present new uh, uh, marketing uh, things that they were going to do, but the gen and. Uh, the, uh, he was doing quite well in his situation, was uh, kind of seen in the store as one of the up-and-coming new uh, uh, you know, young uh, managers. Nevertheless, he was very uh, fearful of these meetings, and particularly because the guy who ran the meeting used to say, well, now you've seen this new presentation, you, why don't you stand up and tell us what you think about this new ad campaign or something like that. And he would just point to somebody and he was in fear of the public speaking aspect uh, of this, that he would be called upon to speak, that he would not think, be able to think of anything to say, would have an anxiety attack and uh, would be terribly embarrassed. There was a traumatic onset to this. He 
recall the situation when he was in high school and in a class he'd been called upon to stand up and read a uh, short story in an English class and he began reading and got a, uh, made a couple of mistakes, stumbled a little bit and started to feel very anxious and like people were laughing at him, they were. Uh, his classmates started giggling and making uh, remarks and such and the teacher just kind of let him go on and on and on it seemed with the class getting more and more uh, uh, impolite and uh, uh, embarrassing him. Uh, so that was the, that was the uh, uh, prototypic kind of situation again was being embarrassed in by people and he had this real sense of sort of an, ex an exaggerated sense of the danger terrible things could happen if you have an anxiety attack in such a situation. There's a uh, concept, uh, Joseph Wolpe, who's a behavior, one of the originators of a lot of behavior therapy techniques, talks about the ultimate aversive consequence. What, what's the worst thing that could happen in this situation uh, for the person? Uh, what what would be the, the, the worst possible consequence? Uh, you stand up, you're called upon, uh, you're, you're not ready to speak, you've been called upon in this meeting, and you start to have an anxiety attack. What is the worst thing that could happen? Well, interestingly, people have difficulty come out, coming up with this often because they, because they haven't th thought of it what the worst thing could happen. They don't get that far in their thinking that is, if you started to get anxious, terrible, awful, horrible things would happen. And they don't really articulate what would happen. And I said with this, uh, talking to this particular uh, man, what, you know, what could happen? Uh, so you have an anxiety attack. You have a terrible anxiety attack. You, you can't get a word out. Your, your voice is frozen. Everyone's staring at you. You know, take the story on. What would happen? Well, you know, uh, what, if, what if you fainted from your anxiety attack or whatever? Uh, and to him, the consequence was he would have an anxiety attack. Everybody would think that he was uh, weak, uh, socially inadequate, uh, and uh, would lose. He would lose everybody's respect and his career in the. Uh, 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 department store uh, business would be over because nobody would have any respect for him. And I asked him, you know, uh, think of another store, another manager of another department. If you were in one of these meetings and that other person stood up and started to uh, become very anxious and fainted dead away in the middle of trying to speak, what would you think? And he said, well, I'd be worried about them. I, you know, as my friend, I'd be worried that something was the matter with him, that he was having some kind of uh, attack of some sort, and I'd want to check it out, and I'd uh, be helpful and reassuring. Well, if you would be like that to somebody else, why wouldn't other people be that way to you? Would you necessarily lose respect for that person? For many people with... Uh, uh, fears their sense of what of what would happen if it's me is very different than what would happen if it's somebody else. If I had the anxiety attack, it would be catastrophic, and I'd be ridiculed and humiliated, etc. If it happened to somebody else, people would be sympathetic and uh, uh, helpful and uh, worried about the person's health. Uh, Treatment in this instance uh, involved uh, having him uh, uh, to try to uh, uh, deal with some of the kind of illogical, irrational aspects of the fear and the uh, danger, some applied relaxation to help him relax in the situations. He, one of the things he would always do would be to, well, a couple things he would do. 
when he went into these meetings, he'd always have something with him that he could hold on to, a Coke can or something like that, because he felt if he held on to something, you couldn't see his hand shaking. Uh, and uh, he also also tried to go in with some question to ask or some statement to make that he could do early in the uh, in the meeting, raise his hand, get up and say what he wanted to say, and then he felt like if he said something early, then he wouldn't be picked on uh, later. Uh, so he always said something at the uh, at the beginning of the meeting. Uh, in any case, one of the things that he came up with that he ended up doing also was he took some uh, a public speaking class, one of these Dale Carnegie things, because he felt if he had if he learned some public speaking skills, then he wouldn't feel so vulnerable to uh, uh, not doing well when he had to speak in public. I thought it was a good idea. Uh, just one other uh, quick uh, description of another uh, case. This was a, uh, uh, a guy who had a very generalized uh, social phobia. He went into virtually any situation with another person feeling that he was kind of one down. They were going to look down on him unless he could fool them into thinking he was adequate in that uh, situation. And uh, what this meant was that there was sort of no way he could feel adequate. He either fooled them, and they didn't see his inadequacy, or he behaved inadequately, and they saw his inadequacy. And there was no other option. There was no, I did that one OK. I did that one uh, well. Uh, he would uh, do things, he had difficulty talking to salespeople. So he uh, would do things like if he wanted, he, had, he was kind of a, a computer person and if he wanted to buy some new component for his computer or his stereo system or whatever, he would uh, drive all over town to compare prices. But he'd have to find the item himself and find out the price and write it down. Then he'd drive to another store. He couldn't call up, and this was a few years ago, so probably before you could get prices on the on the internet uh, easily. But he would spend a whole day driving around town to different stores to find out where he could get the best deal on a, a component for his uh, stereo system. Uh, when he did have to uh, talk to a salesperson who was going to buy some socks, for in instance, he would stand there for five or ten minutes before he'd go up to the salesperson rehearsing what he was going to say and how he was going to say it so that he could impress them and they would think that he was adequate and they wouldn't take advantage of him, which was his fear. He'd also wait till there was nobody else around. He didn't want to wait in line, didn't want to have other people looking at him, etc. So a lot of time went into the sorts of thing. He uh, used to go out to bars, particularly places where there was music, and he would try to meet women. But his methods of meeting women where he would see somebody, a woman who he'd like to talk to at the bar by herself or whatever, and he would say to himself, well, I could say to herself, how do you like the group? And then she would say this, and then I could say, well, I'd like two, but what if she doesn't like it? Then I could say this. And he'd go through about five different lines and all of the options of the conversation before he'd talk to her, and typically she'd be she'd have left or be talking to somebody else by the time he would uh, uh, get up the nerve to do it. And we talked about his experiences there, and it was the same sort of thing. There was no possible win. If he didn't talk to her, that was, of course, a, a failure in the situation. Well, what if he talked to her and had a brief conversation? Well, that would be a failure because he didn't have a longer conversation. What if you had a long conversation with her? Well, that would be a failure because I wouldn't be able to continue the relationship, or whatever. Well, you know, what if she said, you know, here's my number, call me? Well, that would be a failure because I couldn't call her. Uh, I'd be too anxious to, to call her. In any case, it made it clear, I think, to him that as he viewed it, there was no possible success. 
uh, in that situation and virtually any other situation. Every, every experience he had, as he viewed it, validated his, uh, his inadequacy and his uh, uh, inability to uh, uh, have good relationships. Uh, the uh, uh, happy ending to the story was when he met a woman who was uh, fairly assertive. They met at a party and talked about a book and, uh, that he'd read and she said, gee, I'd like to read that. And he said, sort of, well, you know, I'd be happy to loan it to you. She said, well, let's have coffee tomorrow and uh, you, you can bring the book along. And so, so she sort of made the first date uh, and uh, uh, they hit it off and he was, uh, his confidence was uh, greatly enhanced by this relationship and he did very well. Uh, I think I got these, yeah. Uh, next uh, disorder that I want to talk about is uh, panic and agoraphobia. Uh, panic attacks are very intense anxiety attacks that are, have a sudden onset and often typically uh, seem to have no pr uh, precipitating uh, cause. Uh, 85% women uh, with this diagnosis. Uh, onset tends to be from late teenage years into uh, mid-30s. The uh, DSM criteria are that you have to have uh, fairly frequent attacks and their definition of frequent is uh, a minimum of four in a month, four and four weeks. Interestingly, there are people who, ha that are, who are infrequent panickers who have uh, panic attacks less frequently than that, who don't meet the uh, criteria. And there's also a group of people who are referred to as non-fearful panickers. Uh, Dave Barlow, who is the author of your textbook, and is quite a national expert on anxiety disorders, runs a big anxiety disorders uh, clinic in Boston, talks about uh, the uh, comorbidity amongst anxiety disorders. They were doing a big study of people with generalized anxiety disorder, which we'll talk about in a minute, and he said when they interviewed these people, they were surprised at how many of them reported that they also had panic attacks. But what they would often say is, oh, the panic attack doesn't bother me. Those come and go, they're over in uh, 10 or 20 minutes, and, uh, uh, and I'm through with it, and I know it's going to go away, but it's the constant worrying that's really upsetting me. Uh, so there were so, there are sort of panickers that are uh, non-fearful, that is, who aren't terribly bothered by the uh, uh, experience. Uh, in the diagnostic system, the, the, the diagnoses are uh, panic disorder without agoraphobia, panic disorder with agoraphobia, and agoraphobia without a history of panic disorder. The typical, uh, a, a typical sequence for somebody who has panic attacks is that they start having panic attacks in different situations and they develop fears of those situations and then avoid those situations. Fears of those situations is the agoraphobia part of it. So typically you, have, you may have a sequence where the person starts out having panic attacks and they may have, if they have them frequently, they would qualify for the diagnosis of panic disorder without agoraphobia. Then they develop a fear of situations. They have a uh, panic attack in a shopping mall and they stay away from the uh, uh, shopping mall and then uh, get the diagnosis of panic disorder with agoraphobia. Fear of the agora. The agora is the ancient uh, shopping mall, essentially the square uh, where there were stores. Uh, so it's literally sort of uh, uh, panic disorder with fear of shopping malls, which is a 
typical uh, version of agoraphobia. Uh, panic attacks can be induced and people who are subject to natural panic attacks are also particularly susceptible to induced panic attacks. And there are several ways in which this is done. Uh, breathing uh, carbon dioxide can bring on a uh, panic attack. High doses of caffeine can bring it on. And there are also uh, sodium lactate injections which are used to bring on panic attacks. And the, the research on this for a while felt that the, you could differentiate sort of biological panickers uh, by people who were susceptible to these uh, uh, inductions. If, you, uh, if caffeine would induce a panic attack, then you were likely to be a, a biological panicker where there was some uh, dysregulation, dysfunction in your uh, anxiety systems that uh, triggered these. There are uh, part of panic attacks often may be sort of a, a vicious cycle uh, and your textbook talks about being uh, panickers being people who are particularly sensitive to their own internal bodily sensations. There are people who may say, oh, oh I'm starting to get an, an attack. Oh, no, I'm going to have one of those terrible attacks again. And in a, in a sense, the anticipation, the sensitivity to the minor uh, symptom uh, develops into a full-blown uh, panic attack. Uh, panic, people who have panic attacks often fear the attack as being some sign that they're having a heart attack, that they're going to die, that they are uh, going crazy, that they're going to lose control and uh, be embarrassed. There's often a, a certain amount of uh, 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 exaggerated sense of the danger of a, uh, of a panic attack. Panic attacks typically are time limited. Uh, they're, uh, uh, people get over them again in uh, 10, 20 minutes. Uh, but they're uh, viewed as being uh, potentially life threatening often, and this uh, may, may make them uh, worse uh, even after people have a number of them. Uh, and again, your text talks about uh, sensitivity to arousal and seeing this as a danger sign and overreacting to that, uh, to that danger sign. There are biological treatments. Uh, some of the antidepressant medications are actually used for treating the uh, uh, panic disorder. They tend to inhibit the panic. Uh, <coughs> The older generation of tricyclic antidepressants are used and also some of the MAOIs, the monoamine uh, uptake inhibitors. Uh, they have, <coughs> they inhibit the attacks, but they don't have much of an effect on the uh, anticipations of uh, danger. One of the aspects of treatment is to try to sort of normalize the attack. You're not going to have a heart attack. It doesn't mean you're going crazy. It's, uh, uh, it'll be over in a while. Uh, you won't pass out. Uh, uh, relax and just wait for it to be over. The uh, last category here, whether, whether or not people actually do develop agoraphobia without a history of panic is actually somewhat in contention. It's very rare to see, and it may be that agoraphobia without a history of panic is more related to the other kinds of situational phobias and uh, uh, could, be into, could be independent of this. 
Uh, I saw a case a few years ago with an interesting guy who had moved to Houston from out of town. He, uh, he and his wife had grown up in a fairly small town. They'd gone to a local college there. Neither of them had really uh, lived away from the uh, neighborhood where they both uh, grown up. Uh, he got a job with a big company and actually somewhat to his surprise was very successful and sort of rose in the ranks and uh, was offered a promotion to come to Houston. Well, this was a big step for, the bo for both of them, particularly since they hadn't ever traveled much or been away from uh, where they lived, but they d uh, decided that it was uh, worth taking the, uh, the plunge, if you will. Uh, and it was uh, an evening before, just before they were going to move, they had gone out to uh, a movie with some friends, kind of, uh, this was a sort of goodbye little party with the friends, and afterwards they'd gone to uh, get a hamburger someplace, and he described his first panic attack as literally occurring, he was feeling fine, he said, picked up the hamburger, but by the time the hamburger got to his mouth, he was having a full-blown panic attack. His uh, heart was pounding, he felt uh, dizzy and nauseated, he, his eyes were, uh, vision was uh, blurry, and he was sure he was having some kind of uh, terrible heart attack or whatever. Uh, his wife and his friends were very concerned. They rushed him through the emergency room. Uh, the panic attack uh, subsided. They checked him out and uh, couldn't find anything uh, wrong. They suggested that he see his doctor for a more thorough checkup the next day and, and uh, released him. Well, that was uh, the first panic attack. And he started pa having pan panic attacks more frequently after that. By the time I saw him, uh, the, he had moved, uh, but he was having three or four panic attacks a day. Uh, and uh, these often had to do with the job. He had panic attacks on the job. There were parts of the job that he particularly found uh, difficult. Uh, he was now in a position of doing sales where he had to do cold calls uh, and uh, uh, he found that very difficult to do and it was often when he was trying to make phone calls that he'd have a panic attack. He had panic attacks a couple times on the way to work and turned around went home called in sick. Uh, his wife who was very sympathetic liked those days when he was off because she felt very lonely and uh, uh, hadn't made new friends and was missing her friends back where they lived. So uh, she was probably uh, very reinforcing on those days and, and was very sympathetic otherwise to his uh, panic attacks. He described them, uh, although there was this association with work, you could see that, that there was no participants, pre precipitant and he, in particular, I remember him giving me the, the example of his lying on the couch one evening watching the news while his wife was making dinner, and he had a panic attack. And he said, now how could lying on the couch, relaxed watching the news, precipitate a panic attack? And that's often how they're uh, 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 experienced. Uh, I did with him a lot, <coughs> a lot of education about the nature of panic attacks and again that there was no probable real physical danger, taught him some relaxation to try to use uh, if he felt one coming on and uh, to try to help uh, decrease the uh, intensity uh, of them. Uh, He had gotten to the point, however, where he was also avoiding other situations, avoiding shopping malls. Uh, his uh, employer was concerned about the uh, 
problem. He, they gave him medical leave, and uh, so we were able to work fairly intensively. I was seeing him two or three times a week and having him uh, doing exposure for the agoraphobia part of it, and he was being successful there. What you want to do is to have the person, after doing perhaps some imaginal relaxation about the situation and doing relaxation training, to go out to the situation and stay there for a fairly long period of time, even if you have a panic attack, and be able to deal with the panic attack and get over it. So he was going out for an hour, two hours, three hours to uh, uh, shopping malls to get over that part of the attack. Well, we were making good progress, but he was also progressing with his discussions with the people at the office, and they were sympathetic to the fact that he was having these panic attacks and offered him a transfer back to his hometown, which he immediately took. And on follow-up with him, when he, they moved back to their hometown, the panic attacks completely stopped. Uh, one of the ideas about panic attacks is that they may have to do with the person's general level of stress and that if you kind of get to a over a certain threshold of stress these panic, panic attacks may be triggered and what uh, appeared to happen in this instance was the whole situation of the new job had raised his stress level probably sort of over the threshold making him vulnerable to having these uh, uncontrollable sudden attacks when he went back to and out of the stress back to the comfortable situation uh, general stress level went down and he stopped having the uh, panic attacks uh, other ideas in uh, having to do with uh, uh, panic and agoraphobia, they often occur in uh, overprotective families, uh, often where the person has a, a kind of inadequate view of themselves, uh, mother-daughter pairs of agoraphobics are fairly uh, common. Uh, I saw a woman, woman once uh, who had a fairly severe agoraphobia. Uh, she lived in an apartment. Her job, she was the manager of the apartment. Everybody liked her as a manager because she never went anywhere. She was always available and around. Uh, she lived, the apartment building was uh, uh, next to a shopping mall and she could do most of all all of her shopping there she bought clothes from catalogs and I could get other things fortunately there was a, a post office there so she uh, had that uh, and she pretty much lived in this couple of blocks neighborhood for many people with agoraphobia they have safe avenues and safe people uh, she could go to visit her mother uh, her mother incidentally had been agoraphobic as had been her father for a while there was a period when her father hadn't left the room in their home for months uh, but agoraphobias tend to wax and wane and uh, he had gotten over his uh, uh, panics and agoraphobia fairly well she uh, belonged to an agoraphobia support group. They had telephone meetings. Uh, uh, but she was kind of well known. She'd been seen by another therapist and had uh, been uh, some TV program had uh, approached him and she, he approached her uh, to talk about agoraphobia on uh, a news interview about uh, fears and phobias. Uh, she viewed leaving her house in terms of uh, barriers. There were, uh, every stoplight was a barrier. She had a car, uh, didn't have much mileage on it because she didn't use it very often. 
uh, but every stoplight was a barrier to her. And so she, would, she could go one stoplight, maybe two stoplights, maybe three stoplights away, but that was about it. Because if you started to have a panic attack and wanted to come home very quickly, those lights were barriers to getting back. She lived not too far from the railroad tracks, and when she was interviewed on the TV station, she was standing sort of on her side of the railroad tracks talking about how, she, how fearful she would be if she crossed the tracks because what a barrier that would be to returning home. If you crossed the tracks and a train came, you couldn't get back home uh, as quickly as you wanted to. Uh, she had a boyfriend uh, and he was sort of a safe person. When, she, when he was with her, she, he could, uh, she could go farther in the car. Uh, he felt, she felt safe when she was with him. Uh, and they would occasionally go to dinner at friends, and the friends were very accommodating, and they would be invited for dinner at 7 o'clock. Well, they would start out at 6, and maybe they'd get there early, and the friends would welcome them. That's great. They made it. Maybe they would... Uh, uh, get halfway there and she'd start to feel uh, panicky and they'd stop and sit in the car or they'd go back to her apartment and wait a while and then start out again. And sometimes they'd make it at 7.30 or 8 uh, for uh, dinner. Sometimes they'd call and say, sorry, we're just not going to be able to make it. And they'd say, okay, maybe next week sometime and they wouldn't be able to, to make it. She could never count on whether or not she could make it. and. She, would, she tended to do this, I'm, I'm afraid I'm going to have a panic attack, and then retreat and not have the panic attack. Note that that may be reinforcing the panic attack. It's just like the, the dog jumping over the uh, panel to avoid the, the shock. Uh, if you turn around and drive home, you don't have the panic attack, but then you never find out whether you really would have had the panic attack uh, or not. And it was probably negatively reinforcing uh, her fear in a variety of situations. Uh, I did exposure with her, and actually what we did was sort of set up a program uh, of uh, practice going out to different uh, situations and staying for uh, periods of time, even if she had panic attacks. And she was very pleased with the progress she made. She was able to expand the number of stoplights. And her goal, one of her goals was that a certain number of stoplights away there was a movie theater. And she hadn't been to a movie in a long time and enjoyed movies. So she and her boyfriend could go to the movies when she got to that point. I uh, heard from her a year or so after I had seen her. Uh, she and her boyfriend got married. They got married there. Uh, at uh, her where she lived uh, and uh, uh, were uh, quite happy. The, she, the problem that she called me about was that the IRS was auditing her and she wanted a letter from me uh, explaining her condition to the IRS because she couldn't go downtown to the IRS office and she was going to get her accountant to go but she needed uh, a letter uh, explaining that she couldn't go because of her uh, agoraphobia. Uh, again, agoraphobias tend to wax and wane uh, uh, with time. Sometimes people can uh, sort of expand their horizons and other times it comes back. Uh, she was, uh, her territory was very well defined. Uh, other people uh, have places they can go that are sort of safe places. They can go to the store, they can go to certain familiar places. I knew uh, a, a guy back in Pittsburgh who could drive to certain other cities, but they, he could drive to those places because they were familiar, but he couldn't drive the same distance uh, in another direction to, uh, to any other uh, place. Again, people have sort of safe routes, safe places. Uh, any comments or questions on what I've talked about so far? 
All right. Uh, we talked a little bit about generalized anxiety disorder. This is an interesting diagnosis in terms of its uh, history. It has to do with excessive worrying and the diagnostic criteria are that you have to uh, spend a uh, large portion of your time worrying excessively about multiple topics uh, and the worry has to be unreasonable. It's about as occurs fairly equally in men and women as opposed to some of the other anxiety disorders. Incidentally, uh, don't worry, this difference of the predominance of women in the anxiety disorders, men make up for it in substance abuse and elsewhere in the diagnostic manual. So, uh, Generalized anxiety disorder in its history, oh, its onset is typically in the 20s and 30s. The psychodynamic concept uh, is a psychodynamic concept of free-floating anxiety, which means uh, anxiety that's not attached to a particular object. It's not, there's no specific phobia. There's uh, uh, repression is failing and anxiety is the, like the steam escaping from the boiler, but it's not attached to anything. The uh, behavioral approach on the other hand, to generalized anxiety. And I can remember uh, hearing Joseph Wolpe, who was, again, one of the founders of the behavior therapies and desensitization for uh, anxiety. Uh, Wolpe, in a lecture, said, if you diagnose generalized anxiety disorder, it means you haven't inquired closely enough. And he felt that all anxiety was attached to some thought or image or uh, object and that uh, generalized anxiety disorder could be reduced to uh, finding the things that were provoking the anxiety. There's been something of a, of a shift in the nature of the diagnosis to the idea of the to the, to, the sh to the emphasis on worrying. And you have to sort of think of worrying here as a behavior, the act of worrying and spending, a, uh, investing a lot of your time in non-productive uh, worrying. There, uh, uh, the diagnostic criteria say that there have to be two or more topics and that the worry has to be unrealistic. Uh, and typically people are worrying about, uh, oh, their finances, or they're going to lose their job, or something's going to happen to their children on the way home from school, or uh, things where there may be some very slight actual danger, but th where the, uh, the worrying is, uh, is exaggerated. Uh, it's uh, sometimes seen as kind of a residual diagnosis if you can't uh, d diagnose a specific phobia or obsessive compulsive disorder and the person is anxious and worrying, they get this diagnosis. There's a lot of overlap with major depression. People who are depressed are often anxious and people who have generalized anxiety disorder are often uh, depressed. It's uh, uh, there's actually a proposal, I think it's one of, uh, one of the mixed anxiety de depressive disorder is uh, one of those uh, diagnoses uh, proposed uh, for further research uh, before being included. Uh, the, my case example here is uh, one of a worrying graduate student and it was a large part of his worry had to do with uh, worrying about his dissertation. He had a few other things that he worried about, but the major worry was about his dissertation. And what would happen was, would be that he would s sit down to read for his uh, uh, dissertation project, and he'd start reading, and as soon as he'd start reading, he'd start having all of these worrisome thoughts going through his head. 
uh, I'm never going to get this uh, dissertation done. My major professor isn't going to like it. I'm not going to get my degree. My parents are going to be disappointed in me. I'm going to be a failure, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And all of this worry would go on, and the, then he would realize after 10 minutes that he didn't remember anything that he'd read, and he'd have to go back to the beginning of the chapter and and start all over. And he was just making no progress. Uh, so we asked him. Uh, about what percentage of the time do you think you're you're effectively reading versus worrying? And he said, "Oh, I'm probably uh, uh, reading effectively a quarter of the time, 15 minutes of, out of an hour." So we said, "Okay, uh, we're going to uh, try a stimulus control strategy with this. I want you to establish two different places in your apartment." One is your studying place, and that's going to be the place where you study and you do nothing but study. Uh, you don't have the radio on, you don't have the TV, you don't have any snacks there. You, that's where you study. And then we want you to find a chair, uh, and that's going to be your worrying place, your place to do your worrying. So we want you to spend five minutes reading and then go over to your worry chair and sit for 15 minutes and do nothing but worry. Concentrate on your, on your worrying and don't think about your dissertation at all, just worry. Uh, so he tried this out and it tended to work. When he was reading and he would start to have a worrisome thought, he'd say, no, I'll, do, I'll do that in five minutes. Uh, and he'd go and sit in his worrying chair and have all these worrisome thoughts. And if you try to do that, it gets to be difficult. You know, you know got to worry for three more minutes. <laughs> uh, uh, it's, it's difficult to sort of do the, th the thing that you're trying not to do uh, for an extended period of time. So what we did was say, okay, now start doing 10 minutes and 10 minutes. Now do 15 minutes of of studying and five minutes of worrying and he started you know he would cheat and read for 20 minutes because he was into the chapter or whatever and then he would go uh, worry for his his five minutes uh, and it turned out to be a very uh, uh, successful kind of uh, strategy uh, and again it's a stimulus control uh, uh, strategy uh, Uh, Tom Borkovic is a researcher at Penn State uh, on generalized anxiety disorder. And he has this interesting idea. He's done, first of all, he's done some interesting studies. He's done things like have people uh, with uh, pagers, and he'll send them out with a pager, and he will page them at random during the day and ask them whether or not they're worrying at that point and what they're worrying about. As, uh, people tend to say, oh, I worry 90% of the time. Well, they really don't. They worry somewhat less than that, still high, relatively high percentages. But he was able to sort of do a naturalistic study of finding out what percentage of the time people actually were worrying. But his idea about worry is that uh, excessive, unrealistic worrying is actually a behavior that lets you avoid worrying about the th things that are really bothering you. So he feels that uh, worrying behavior is sort of a defense against uh, thinking about or dealing with the real problems in your life. And if you're having problems, one way to kind of not deal with them is to worry about uh, some other things. So he tried, he, uh, his techniques have to do with trying to explore kind of what's going on, what kind of conflicts may be occurring in uh, people's lives and trying to uh, deal with them. Uh, well, let me, we're about uh, out of time, uh, so actually maybe I'll just stop there uh, instead of beginning with obsessive compulsive disorder. Any questions or comments on these disorders? All right, let's uh, stop and we'll pick up with obsessive compulsive disorder next time.